Good morning again. Or should I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa kullu amun wa antum bi khair. Well, let me translate it. It means peace be unto you. And also those who are near to you and those who are far away from your heart, actually. Uh, to them too. So, all the blessings, but you know where it comes from. It comes from the scripture. When Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared in this room to his disciples, he said, Shalom lakum, peace be unto you. Today, 1.7 billion Muslims say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be unto you and his blessings and his mercy. But they do not know where this blessing, grace and mercy comes from. And that's what this whole thing is all about. Is this okay? The, okay. Uh, because it's kind of like uh, I can hear something <laughs> behind me. Uh, anyway, so here this morning I am here with you. It's amazing, English uh, is not uh, my cup of tea. That's what the British would say. Even in England, learning English language uh, for such a long time uh, it has always been such a problem that sometime when I'm speaking and to friends, they would become a little bit annoyed and say, would you like a cup of tea before you go? It means we had enough for, for you. So this morning, uh, what I'm, what's on my heart is, you know all those hymns or songs what was the main theme of it? Anybody? The Holy Spirit. It's so strange that in today's society and even among churches, many people talk about the Father as our God, Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior, but they don't talk very much about the Spirit of God. And even if it comes part of the Trinity of God, they just push it aside or push him aside. And right from the beginning, from Genesis, when we see the Spirit of God is there. Why? Because Jesus says, God is spirit, and he wants you and me to worship him in spirit. But where does this come from? Well, it comes in our hand from this scripture. I thank God that this scripture was available to me in my language. Otherwise, it would have taken another 40 years to understand it in another language. It's amazing that when I check these translations, although I speak so-called seven or eight languages, and uh, the jack of all trade, uh, but not master of it. So, I am amazed that this scripture so easily talk to you in those languages as well, even in English. Right in the middle, can you see it? Right in the middle, Psalm 139. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light unto my path. Wow. If you stand up and you start thinking about it, Words, and of course, when we call it books, can be written. There'll be no end of it. Just on that phrase. And then there is this promise, just in verse 110 of Psalm 119. I will not forget your law, 
The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. We are living in a fallen world, a fallen world that does not want to come to God. And yet God in his mercifulness and sometime like a father will be a little bit upset with his children. He gets upset too. Because we are born in his image and we get upset too. But that does not mean that he likes to send us to hell if we don't like it. Or he does not like it. Although many religions teach that. It's incredible that growing up as a Muslim, now when I look back, that how God has worked in everyone's life where they should be and where they will be. But then he has given them this free will to choose. To choose life or to choose death. That was the reason that all these angels around him did not have any opportunity. If they did something wrong, there was it. That's what happened to the one known as to us, Iblis, to some he's known as Satan, that he walked away. When we sing unto the Lord, here was this, whom we know Satan, living in his glory to praise God, and then turns around, I am something. And you know the rest of the story, what happened. But God was not caught by a surprise. That's what the scriptures show us. He was not. In his foreknowledge, he already knew this was going to happen. And so when this Satan came with his fake news and talked to Adam and Eve, and they got it, that fake news got them in trouble. So, here we are, through generations, through first Adam, we lost our eternity. Did it surprise God? Oh no. But the realization is that, that God, who wants relationship, oh, talk to Muslims about relationship, they don't want to. This God is so unknown that our relationship with him is only him being the master and we as his servants. No more, no less. See how half truth is? Like the fake news? You can't build a fake news on total lie. But what you do is, you take out the backbone from it, and that's what Satan has been doing. He cannot create anything new. So he takes something good, and then messes up, fashions it in a way to give it to you. Oh, this is another Bible another scripture, this is also the word of God. And look at 1.7 billion Muslims so ready to kill for God. Because the Quran says, God loves those who kill for him. Yeah, it's there. At which side of that word kill we do not understand. But we are living in a world we want to kind of like cover it up, fashion it, and to be lovey dovey, not realizing that there is a trap under that branches 
and we may fall in it. This is what is happening. It's not 1.7 billion Muslims who are the problem. It's not that those who do not call themselves Christians, that they are the problem. It's, these are the ideologies which are the problems. 1.7 billion Muslims do believe in the Bible, the scripture, yet they say that Bible is corrupted. See how easy it is. Oh yes, we do believe in Moses. We do believe Abraham. We do believe in David and all these prophets. But these Christians and Jews got together and they corrupted the scripture. So God had to send another prophet. 600 years after Muhammad. I mean after Jesus. Thank you. See, God has given me a helper. Again, the scripture fulfilled there. And so, this Muhammad comes up with the idea. He does not know even People ask him, so what is this Holy Spirit tell us if you are the prophet of God? And he only says that it is the Amr of God. Amr means command, the command of God. That's it. But to you, only less information is given, so don't ask many questions. A person just had to check in the scripture, in the Bible. If it is not the word of God, then what is it? Well, we look for prophecies. We look for what is the whole story. And the whole story is very simple. And that is that through first Adam, we lost our eternity. Through Christ, the second Adam, we are restored again. In a nutshell, that is the story of the scripture. So from Abraham to Moses to David and to prophets like Isaiah, Daniel, Micah, and Zechariah were told about Jesus as the Savior. When we talk about reliance on the Word of God, it just occurs to me again and again that people will say, yes, this is about Jesus and about God. They will say, yes, it can be taken. But there will be a hush when you say, they will say it is about the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and about the Father. But again, half-truth. They will feel difficult when you say, this is the Word of God. Can you imagine how manipulation takes place? And this is what is happening. And yet, a person like me, growing up in Islam, one of my creed, you know, like the Jewish people, Muslims also have a lot of creeds, and even uh, Christian hierarchy, the apostle creeds, and this creed and that creed, they have. So the Muslim's creed is, I believe in Allah and his angels, and his books, and his prophets. And then it goes on to, well, yom al akhir and the last day. Very well. But when it comes to these books, they do believe that yes, whatever Moses brought and Jesus brought, we believe in them. Growing up as a Muslim and uh, wanted to become a Muslim missionary because when I was a child, you have Sunday schools, we used to have Friday school. In these Friday schools, they brought this missionary who had gone to Sierra Leone in Africa to preach the message of Muhammad, 
of his love. And so when I saw that, I do not know why I decided to be a Muslim missionary when I grow up. And that's what was happening in my life. But one thing I realized that in Islam, even at the Islamic uh, seminary, or I would call it a cemetery, what I learned was that a Muslim's faith is not just to believe, believe, believe. It should be shown by action as well. So, as a Muslim, I believed that, yes, if I believe in something, I should be showing that I really believe. So here was my question, that if I believe in the scripture given to Moses and given to Jesus, why I do not act upon them? Why do I say they are corrupted? And it was there that something started in my mind. How can God say, now this is as a Muslim I'm thinking, See, God is capable to use whatever circumstances you are facing, whatever you are reading, He is capable of to warn you, to bring you to the truth. And once that has happened, then your responsibility is to leave that and follow the real truth. That's what has. And that's what happened in my life as well. That if Muslims believe that God's words cannot be changed, several places in the Muslim holy book of the Quran, it says that God's words cannot be changed. It says, La tabdila li kalimatihi. His words cannot be altered. So how dare these Christians and Jews were able to corrupt it? And that's what got me. Yes, had it not been someone like you, I would have never received the Gospel of John at age 13. Oh yes, all those Christians brought all those food packages too. But they did not forget the scripture. Hallelujah. That food which perhaps was gone after 24 hours or 48 hours, this way came and the other way it was gone. But that gospel remained with me. Yes, it was taken from me just a few days later. I was so surprised. Muslims do not believe that God is our father. It's blasphemous to say God is our father. Yet I was reading this gospel of John in my own language that it clearly says that God is our father. How do you pray? Call him. Father in heaven. Abada fi sama. As the Arab will say. Not the Muslims, but the Christians. Abana, our Father who is in heaven. And so my question to my teacher was the next Friday Is God, could God be our Father? And he said, Masood, where did you get this information from? That would be the literal acting of those words he said. And I told him that I have this Injil, the gospel. He took me home, showed me all the four gospels he had in the Bible. You know, having a Bible does not make you something so big in God's eyes. It is the action and the reaction of it which... And then, of course... He does not leave you alone. He says, I would give you another advocate like him. And that advocate is the Holy Spirit of God. And so, he said, these people have four Gospels, while we as Muslims believe one Gospel was given. I didn't understand. He brought me home and took that Gospel away from me. Now, brothers and sisters, you have supported so many missions through the ages. Does the story finishes? You do something for the Lord and you never know. Leave it to the Lord. This is that Lord, he says in the very scripture. 
through a prophet in the Old Testament, that the word that goes from my mouth will never return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. And just a few years later, age 15, I was given this Gideon New Testament. I didn't pay for it. Came from your pockets. Somebody like you read it, likes reading, but put it aside. But when your heart is really want to know this God, what is he up to? That's where the whole thing changes. At the seminary, as a working student, I realized that Islam is a work-related religion on one hand. But on the other, it looks for God's grace and mercy. And even Muhammad says, listen, I do not know what will happen to me or to you. But then he says, continue what you are doing, all the prayers and everything. But on the day of judgment, if God will show you his mercy, then you will be accepted. And people asked him, what about you, O prophet of God? And he said, not even me, unless God covers me with his grace and mercy. So where does one get this grace and mercy? And it was there that one day, you know, there are moments in your life that when you come to the end of the rope and you rely on him, Lord, what is going to happen? There was war between India and Pakistan, and things kind of changed for me. Because here I was, age 20, 21, going to die. All these near naval, living near naval headquarters, and all these uh, bombs were falling, and I started reciting some portions of the Quran. And all of a sudden, I realized that I was reciting one of the exposition of faith, and that was that I believe whatever was given to Moses and Jesus, and I do not make any distinction among them. And like somebody said, hello, if you do not make any distinction among them, why don't you go back and read them? And it was then that I took, at the age 20, to get a whole Bible and start reading it. And then realized that it all comes to one person, and that is Jesus. It is not Muhammad. It is not Moses. It is not Abraham. Although a lot of Muslims are trying in this country, so that you will not say Judeo, Christian heritage. You should say Abrahamic heritage so that we Muslims are also part of it. And then there are Christians they will say, okay. But it's not about Abraham. Even Abraham was told, yes, many nations will be blessed through you. But it was somebody else. It was not Moses. Moses was already told clearly that there will be a prophet like him who will be born. And so, when we see, this is what in John chapter 4 verse 6, Jesus said to these Jewish believers and also these Jewish people who said, our Moses one of the greatest prophets on this earth. And he says, if you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. And where would you find that? There are many Christians in this country, and it really burns my heart, that they will say, oh, we are under the New Testament, which is okay, yes, that is fine. So don't talk about the Old Testament. But how can you understand the New Testament if you don't understand the Old Testament? 
How can you understand what Jesus said if you don't go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 18, where it says, God said twice to Moses. And when he says twice, and then he goes for the third time, then be careful. And he says, listen, I will raise another prophet like you among your brethren, among the Israelites, and you should listen to him. And any who would not listen to him, I myself will require dot, dot, dot. Why didn't you listen? Now, fast forward into the New Testament, and this is Jesus who arrives on the scene at his baptism. We see the Father, the Holy Spirit, as do, and the Son. And the Father says, listen to him. In him I'm pleased. At the transfiguration, there is Moses. There is another prophet and there is Jesus. And Peter, as usual, always ready to say something, says, it would be nice. We built up three tents here, or my language says forts <laughs> here. In other words, let's forget about that who are up there. We should have our own three monastic tents here and just forget about the rest of the world. And what is happening, God again tells them, listen to him. Not anymore. The prophet Moses, or whether Isaiah, Jeremiah, or something. Oh yes, they had a place. But they all were referring to that. Here are people who say, oh, we are Abraham's children. And other are out. Muslims say they are Abraham's children. And all are out. And yet, Jesus says, if you were really the children of Abraham, if Abraham was really your father, you would listen to me. If you go back to the original language and you find even in the Greek, I wish we had the Aramaic available to us, you see that, oh my goodness, how clear Jesus was to them. This is that Lamb of God, so lovey-dovey, that he was saying things as it is. Oh yes, it is time that we should present the Lamb of God. But at the same time, let's present him the Lion of God as well, who is coming to judge the world. Otherwise, it's no use. It's no use. I thank God that somebody was clear enough to help me to understand these things. And then one day, myself, reading the Gospel of John again at age 21, 22. And there in the first chapter it says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. A Muslim dilemma, how I may get grace, how I may know my assurance in this very life. Oh no, you can't. You have to. So whenever you ask a Muslim, are you sure that by all the performance you are doing to go to pilgrimage, hajj, to perform prayers and fasting, all this, God will accept you in his paradise? And they would say, inshallah, if God wills. My dear Muslim friend, that God has already willed for you that anyone who come through Christ Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There it is. There it is. So here is Jesus telling that before Abraham was, I am. Do you know that Muslims celebrate uh, a great sacrifice called Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice, once a year? It's in the memory of Abraham's son. Whatever name they would give him, 
Nowadays, usually they say it was Ishmael, but that's not the case. The Quran says, وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِزَبْهِنْ azim," And we ransomed him with a great sacrifice. And Muslims have no idea what that great sacrifice was. The Quran says, well, that ram which was provided in the place of the sun, that was the great sacrifice. Can a ram be equal to a human being? No, even they say. And another thing is that it says we ransomed him, in other words, Abraham, with a great sacrifice. Talk about Islamic dilemma. The answer is in the Bible. You go to Galatians and you find that how Abraham had already received the gospel. Abraham, as I ask you, go and sacrifice your son. In reality, I am going to do that one day for the world. Not only that, but also defeat death. Death brought through first item. And so this continues, and it just amazes me. Here is Jesus. He does it for us, for you and me. But then he also asks you and me to be part of the mission. He says, as the Father sent me, I send you. It appears in the Gospel of John. It is also in Luke, because Luke writes the book of Acts too. And in the great commission of Matthew, who can forget? But, yes, he says that. But those who are in the mission field, they should not forget that Jesus also mentioned in Acts chapter 1, stay until when you receive the Holy Spirit you will be my witnesses we send missionaries we put our hands in them but do we mention that that Holy Spirit who came on that day now be with you go that not only the Father the Son but the Holy Spirit is now in you. And as you have been given free, give it to you. I'm so thankful to God that yes, that was shared with me. And today I'm here. Oh yes, there had been situations which were different. But one thing today people ask and they say, Oh uh, well, uh, in our schools, in our colleges, and in other places, what are we going to do? They don't want us to say the name Jesus. Oh yes. I have seen places even in England and Europe and other places where they will collectively be sitting, all these people, and when it comes to say in the name of Jesus, they would not say in the name of Jesus. Some will say, in the name of the Lord. So a Muslim is hearing it, oh, perhaps he mentioned Allah or Muhammad. And a Hindu is saying he's thinking about uh, his God. A Buddhist is thinking about his Buddha. This is what had, has come to us, that we do not say Jesus. So Stephen, what are we going to do? Why are we asking even such a question? Let's go back to Acts chapter 4, 12. You have read it so many times. It's there. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Did you see that? those words? No other name under heaven so why are we shy away from it? So why are we shy away from it? 2,000 years have gone. Yes, 
if you read uh, the book of Acts, and you already know I'm preaching to the co choir, but that's me. Reminder is a good thing. We see this again and again, that they are told, don't say that name. Don't mention that name, Jesus. And what did they say? When you read the context, it clearly says, the judge for yourself, should we listen to you? Should we listen to you or to him? Because there is no other name under heaven been given through whom we can be saved. And then this reference appears. Oh, Lord, forgive us where we have come to. Please, I'm not uh, upset with you, but let's be reminded, let's, this is the time that we should stand up and should not water down the scripture, not water down the scripture. If we believe we are his missionaries, then we are his missionaries. As God sent Jesus as a missionary, his own son, now he is sending us to the world in the name of Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and in his own name. Then we should play like missionaries. There are missionaries now, oh, you know, Stephen, Let's uh, Muslims to be both sides. They can be called secret believers. They can go to mosque and pray five times a day, and then they can read the recitation of the Quran, and then they can read the Bible. What kind of language that would be? That in the Quran it says, I'm reciting as a Muslim now, playing the trick. And they did not kill him nor crucified him, but actually God took him up to himself, reciting that portion. And then I come home and sit with the churches. Through Christ you have been saved. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, death has been defeated. What is this language you now? Yes, I know it is difficult. But Jesus also mentioned that when they persecute you in one city, flee to another. Because that's the way he does his mission. It's a voluntary go situation and it is also an involuntary situation. God has done that. Look the whole Old Testament. There has been times that, yes, people were not volunteering. Think about Jonah. God still had to complete his mission. That was in voluntary go. There are many who are coming into this world. In your universities and colleges, they come for education. But God has a purpose. Yes, a lot of other people come for a lot of other reasons. But God has his purpose. So there is always that tension built up. But if we want to be his missionaries, let's not make it. Yes, if we can make it easy for people, that is one way. But not at the expense of the scripture or faith. That's what we have to do. We still have to help these people. But when it comes to faith... Oh, yes. Please, please. Let's go back to the scripture and what it says we should believe in. I thank God that when I read the scriptures in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You can tell all the stories, but if those stories do not come from here and do not align with the Word of God, I would suggest please discard them. Anything you see, whether it's a dream from God, whether it's a word from God, if that contradicts this, you 
are in big, big trouble. That's what Satan wants to do. Let's be careful. Be careful about it. Check it out. Oh, yes. I come from the Islamic countries. Here, people, when they have a dream, they would start thinking the next morning, usually that's what happens. Oh, perhaps it was that pizza I ate. And then later on realize, oh, it was really God speaking. But in Muslim countries and other, yes, God is speaking to people. Places like Saudi Arabia where I smuggled Bibles. Can you imagine that there will be people, there will be a person coming to me and sitting at this corner coffee place and say, I saw you in my dream. You have a green book for me. It had a little bit uh, pink color spread over it like uh, ink fallen on it. How would he know? Only five people knew in Cyprus about it. That when we were printing Bible and the cover of it, something went wrong with the machine and with the green color, a pink color, red mixed up and that's why. But we didn't want to destroy the book. We wanted to still, and here comes this person. And in his dream, he sees me giving him the Bible, which had kind of splatter. It seemed like, it looked very nice. It seemed the blood of Jesus, like, <laughs> kind of showing the picture of it. And this person, what should I do? Was a secret service agent? Perhaps he was. He was a Mahathasib, perhaps. But what can you do? And I gave him, never saw him again. We here have so many Bibles in our homes and other. Thank God that countries like Saudi Arabia and several other places, they can't get away with it. Now, anywhere, any place, you can reach your iPhone and you can. Oh, yes. You know the Nokia company? Do you know Nokia? Nokia, the German company, it made an alliance with Saudi Arabia that it will stop, uh, it will make uh, a, a type of software that it will stop uh, the Bible apps. Where is the company gone? Do you hear it? God wants people to know about Christ. No doors, no fences can stop it. I still remember I would arrive at the airport when it was the busiest time that we were instructed to do that. And I would say, Lord, you open the eyes are people who could not see. I'm going through that green channel at this moment. Please close the eyes of that person who is going to check me. And it has happened. And you tell me that this scripture is just written by words, just by people who invented those words. They followed fibs. Everybody wants to write things about their forefathers, how good they were. You will never mention in this uh, woman's testimony, because even in Jesus' times, women were treated as, I don't know what English words, we have a word, tutu. Get away. Only when I need you. That type of society I lived in. And even at that time, that was. And yet, Jesus appears to women first. That's so much so that uh, they go and talk. If we men were there, I feel that we would have seminars on it. Let's talk about it first before we spread this rumor. And yet God used them. 
that tells you it could have written this and when we received the message not mentioning who said it when we received the message that Jesus was risen so John and Peter and I just started running towards the grave it would start like that but no it had to be mentioned that gives you the evidence that there is something unique about it that God used. That's what, you know, people check the testimony. Here's a police officer, he can tell you. These are those nuggets that seen that what truth is coming through. Not kind of like mixed by traditions and upsetness and other things. So, when uh, the scripture which was just mentioned to you, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, there is another scripture in the same chapter, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Oh, please, I really thank God that somebody gave me that gospel. I thank God somebody share that good news with me. I thank God that when I was dunked, I was baptized, I was not left alone. I was discipled. How much time would you give to somebody to disciple them for Christ. If you don't, you could be in big trouble. God will ask, yes, you help this person to know about Christ, but how much time you spent with this person to continue because Satan doesn't care about those people who are already his. He's more annoyed and upset when you take a person and help him to know Christ and then leave him alone or leave her alone. That's where the whole thing comes. That's what call fellowship together and to help that person to grow in Christ. That's why these small groups and men's Bible study, women's Bible study, and getting together to know, all together to know. That's what accountability is all about. I really thank God. That is the reason that we all are called. It's not just one person. We all are called. Yes, to each one of us are given gifts. If you are given all the gifts, hallelujah, praise God. Please use them. But then find out that what is it that God has put into your heart, which is so near to your heart. And that's all the gifts. And then use it for his glory. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So God's Spirit has not left us alone. Be available to Him. And He will mightily use you through the gift He has given you. You know, at times we say this again and again. And Him, all this Him we say, there is none like you. You sing it to the Lord. It was here just a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night. Oh yes, there are prayers here on a Wednesday night. Please do come if you can. Please. And all of a sudden I heard a kind of like saying, God, there is none like you. I, ca I can't sing. Yes, uh, there's something happened in my life as a childhood that I can't sing. But while you are singing, I kind of mostly read. When I say I can't, 
Of course I can, but there are times that it will mess your tune. <laughs> I, I was told often, Stephen, you just read it, we will sing it for you. So there is none like you, and all of a sudden, there is this response. I said, Lord, there is none like you. And you know what the response was? And there is none like you. Pastor Steve, there is none like you. There is none like you, sister. There is none like you. There is none like you. Every one of us is unique in Christ. This is what our society needs to know. That you are not a failure. There is... You are special in God's eyes. There is none like you. And you become more special if you believe in Christ, the Messiah, the living word of God, that he is your savior. The whole identity crisis comes to a halt in a right direction. That's your ID. That there is none like you. There is none like you. Stephen, there is none like you. Oh, yes, you are speaking in Pakistani more than English. There is none like you. But that ID, we become united and one people through Christ. So please check what is it that God wants you and me to be in his calling. As I said, I wanted to be a Muslim missionary right from childhood. Yes, it's very difficult. Nowadays, you ask children, what would they like? Some wants to be doctors, some wants to be this, and then they can't, and then they change their subjects and all these. I can understand that. And it happens. There are times, and there are these things happen. But what I'm asking is that apart from that, what does God want you to do for him? Even if you are an engineer, and even if you are something in the world business, God still wants you to use that. In my case, he called me to teaching, to sharing. I could not become a Muslim missionary, a salesman for Islam, but I became a servant for the Lord. Well, that's the way I chose. Because if everybody becomes in one area, there will be difficulty of situation. But then, who cares about? If God has called you, why not share? Yes, there are times that it has been impossible to think whether we live or die whether at work or whether at other places, eventually it is all about God to share. And that's where I will make it simple is our ministry comes along. As I have received, I want to share it with other people. The mission to the Islamic world is very distressed. There is only Back in the 80s, 2% of all the missionary efforts in the world, when you put it together, I'm not a good mathematician, but all those who do, they tell that from 2% instead of rising, can you imagine 800 million Muslims back in the 80s, 2% of the missionary efforts were directed to them. Now, they are 1.7, actually some would say 1.9 billion Muslims because they want to have more children. Yes, I grew up having 14 brothers and sisters around me, so I was the 15th one. Three mothers. Imagine this. Here in this country, people do not want to have children. The blessing of God. What a strange world we are living in. Anyway, coming back to that situation that nowadays it's only 1%, that two is gone down. We talk about short-term missionaries and even missions. When missionaries go and work, because these are the hard places, 
they cannot establish a church, they cannot talk to some people, and there are a lot of things they have to go through. And after four years, five years, they are called back. And they are directed to other countries where they can establish a church. And some of these friends I have met, they feel like failure. And I keep telling them, please do not feel that you are a failure because you sow the seed. I gave my example to them. It took 10 years from that first gospel so the effort worked in my life. I could have easily walked away from it. But I thank God I didn't. I want to see that person who gave me that gospel. I want to see that person again who gave me that New Testament. I thank God for people like Henry Martin who back in the 19th century, only did the pioneer work of Urdu translation of the Bible. He did not even live to see the whole translation. See, somebody does a pioneer work, and then the building is built. There are times that it takes more time on the foundation. Have you seen? these big, big buildings, sometimes it's months and years they are doing testing and all that. And once that foundation comes along, then they say, oh, I didn't realize they were building something over there. That's what happens with the Lord as well, that he wants to sow the seed and continues. So we have this ministry called Jesus to Muslim, reaching Muslims and equipping Christians. That's what and in the nutshell, we have, that's what Karen was uh, sharing this with you. So, how God is using the gift he has assigned me? There are times that when I want to share the gospel with other people, there will be something comes up which is totally different. Because there was a time in my life that because of the situation, don't start thinking that I always believed that the Holy Spirit and uh, the things which are written in this scripture was for all the time. Like anybody else, I started thinking that there are certain things which are addressed to a particular nation and a particular people. And yes, that is true. But if the blessing is shared with Israel, why can't it be for the people of God who are the spiritual Israel as well at the same time? But there was this tension which was going on that how do I communicate with the Holy Spirit of God? And I realized that the Holy Spirit of God works in you in ways beyond we can't try to measure him. This is the way it should happen to me. So then I will see. Karen shared with you one of the book, Jesus or Muhammad, A Question of Assurance. See how God works. He uses people. He also uses his spirit in you for somebody else. I was giving a seminar back uh, several years ago. It seemed like yesterday and sometimes seems like way behind. Anyway, and uh, this gentleman came to me and he said, uh, you know, it'd be good that you mention something about Jesus and Muhammad at the same time mentioning about the Quran and about the Bible. Okay, it stuck with me and I put something together. Two years later, the book was. See how God works. Now, the two books, the Bible and the Quran, and Jesus or Muhammad, not only distributed around the world, but also it has become part of uh, a college, a Christian college, to use it 
to be trained reaching Muslims. See how God does these things. But let me share with you. This is just heart from the press. Through the first created man, Adam, we human beings lost our eternity in paradise with God through the mediation of the second Adam, known as Jesus the Messiah, the perfect human being. God has paved the way for us all to be restored. Nothing to do with me. But to show how when we rely on the scripture, how God uses. Like anybody else, so I was convicted uh, to write something like this, but I was not paying very much attention. You know there are things when you say tomorrow, and tomorrow never comes. These things happen. It's all over the world. What do the Spanish would say tomorrow? Manana. The Arabs will say Bakara. The Urdu speaking will say Kal. And it goes on. And that Kal, that Manana, and that Bakara comes someday, or perhaps never comes. And it was that type of situation that I had to slow down, because like anybody else, Last year, I got that silly thing as well. It was kind of flu. Of course, it was terrible. And then one night, I was reading the scripture. You know, there are sicknesses when overcome you, and it has happened only twice to me. When you feel so lonely somehow, you can't share it with somebody else or you have this feeling what happened and that was the feeling this particular night uh, because Canon was also feeling now downward so she was in the bedroom I kind of like could not sleep so I came and sat in the living room and uh, pressed that uh, thing and of course it comes out. What's that? Uh, yeah, she has quite a few of them. <clears throat> anyway, so here I am. And as usual, trying to read the scripture, first with the iPhone, started reading it. That was the only thing happened. You know, there are times, and many times, the scripture speaks to you like it has been written for you. Now think about this. I will not go into the whole story, but here it is. Romans chapter 14, verses 7 to 8. It says, For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. Now think about it. Talking about death here too. Yes, it talks about life, but it talks about death. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And I said, Lord, please let me know. Is, this, is it this way or this way? <laughs> is it time to go? <laughs> and... As continue reading, and I reach now in Corinthians, you know, there is the Romans, and it is kind of like reading, reading, reading. And then I reach, and there it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. It's kind of like the confession of faith. Talk about Apostle Creed here. For us, there is but one God. Think about it. As a Muslim, I grew saying, La ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. In other words, Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. There is the Christian creed here as well. For us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. My goodness. Look at that. Look at that. Chapter 8, verse 6. Talk about it. See, 
Read it again and again and how it clarifies to you. And so, I remember that, oh, the Lord had convicted my heart to write a book, No God But One. And I didn't. I just continued. I just continued. I, while thinking about these things, I just kind of, you know, dozed off. And there I see, can you imagine a dream in a dream? And in this, I will not go into the detail, but I'm sitting in W.H. Smith. W.H. Smith is uh, um, like a bookshop, like nobles, Barnes and Nobles in England. And I see that there is uh, a writer's desk you know, when a new writer comes and uh, they introduce and the book and uh, he signs or she signs the book. And on the side, this uh, three-prong stand, uh, uh, stand uh, uh, with, a, with a tablet on and all that. And there is this poster. And this poster has the picture like this. And it said, one God, one mediator, one people, but there was no name on it. And I said, this person who was standing, who is the author? That's a very catchy title. And he says, you are. And I woke up. Just think about it. I was looking later on for a picture. And as I went, the very first place I got was this picture which I had seen in my dream. Think about coincidences. There is no such thing, coincidence. Oh no, God orchestrates things to do. So this is what I, I did. And of course, in the next three weeks, God just poured his heart at me. And I said, Lord, it'd be nice. Why I'm writing this alim in Pakistani English? Why don't you just dictate it to me? And he says, then you will do this. You need other people to help you too. Thank you, dear sister, coming along. Thank you, my dear wife, to come along. Thank you for the church who were praying for me. This is what happens. You may not even know that you prayed for me. But God sees it. That's what happens. We take the first step. And that's what is happening. Somebody came along to support the project, to give a thousand copies away. <laughs> it's just amazing that I opened my eyes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 to 12. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, if I have disobeyed you. But there it is. And I'm reading now in Second Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's what happened. That's what it is all about, that to help. Just last Tuesday, you know, we have to look every time what is happening around us. Ask a police officer. You have to be aware, aware. Perhaps it happened in my case. This life is given once, and we should use it to the full for his glory. So there had been a lot of attacks on my life, and I was every time try to be aware. Even when I was sitting at a restaurant, I had to choose a place from where I could see other people as well. That's the way life has been. Life in America has all changed for me. I don't care anymore. Uh, I'm over 70 years old, but if he wants me to live 137, I would not regret it. But last Tuesday, I 
thought about it. You know, in my country, we say, don't extend your feet beyond your comforter. Have you thought about that? OK, let me explain. You know, it becomes so cold sometimes that if you have a small blanket and you try to uh, extend it, your feet will go out. And of course, you will catch cold. So they will say, don't, in other words, don't go beyond your means. Don't go beyond your means. Don't spend beyond your means. And so here on the Tuesday, because I had to give some books to at South Point Church uh, to some friends, and they had this meeting about the Holy Spirit as well. And all this was going on. And I'm thanking God for the thousand copies paid for to be sent out and all this. And I said, Lord, it's already happening and all this. And uh, I'm giving the prayer of Thanksgiving. And all of a sudden, and I thought it was Karen touching my shoulder, but she was sitting actually. Uh, and I heard like this. Can you imagine in your American English, hey, don't let yourself off the hook. Commit yourself to a million copies. Lord, what is this? And I opened my eyes and saw uh, Karen was sitting there, of course, and I was, I was so surprised. And then I realized, while I was thinking and praying, I realized there are one and a half million international students in this country. 60,000 students from Saudi Arabia. 40,000 among them are on scholarship from the Ministry of Education that provide full tuition, health insurance, and a monthly stipend. There are children, your children are rubbing their shoulders with Muslim children in schools, colleges, and universities. Go to Gainesville, you'll find it. Go to Tampa and other places. There are. Yes, there are children who may not even say they are Muslim, yet they are. They need Christ as well. They need Christ. And so my heart started moving about this. And see how, now you may say, Stephen, what's the result? Well, that's not mine to think about. Jesus healed 10 people, only one came to serve him. Our responsibility is to wear him and share him. You know, Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says, Make every effort to do what leads to peace. Oh yeah, the world talks about peace. But this peace is about Christ, the Prince of Peace. What leads to peace? Jesus, the Prince of Peace. The Lamb of God, who is coming back as the Lion. His second coming. It is time that we not only talk about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but the one also who is coming to this world to judge it. If the judgment is going to start from us, what will happen to those people? It is all there for the taking. But all this would not be if we as the body of Christ are not united but how that unity can come, it can come to come back to rely on the Word of God. And when the Word of God clearly says, stay, you will run to all the world. I thank God that this church is involved in that. I thank God for that. So, I should finish that there, brother that uh, this is all for you and me. Please forgive me, I think in my own language and then I translate it and that's why you see that pause. Uh, those who are recording uh, these things, they know that there is a pause coming. So thank you so much. But I wanted to share that heart, this heart with you. And if you want to know more about this, that how this can help you and others to know about Christ, we are out there. Uh, do visit us. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Thank you, Stephen and Karen. Would you bow with me as we close in a word of prayer? Don't forget to visit them out front when, as you leave today. Father, we just thank you so much 
for your goodness and your mercy. God, would you give us a passion not just to reach our neighbor and those around us, but would you give us a passion to reach this 1.7 billion Islamic people that desperately need to know you, Jesus. God, just empower us with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would go with each one of us today, God. Place a hedge of protection around us and use us for your kingdom. That your son Jesus would be lifted up and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.